Kia ora, I'm Erica Wilkinson, New Zealand's Acting Threatened Species Ambassador, and this is the Doc Sounds of Science podcast. Every episode, we talk about work being done behind the scenes by Doc's technical experts, scientists, rangers, and the experts in between. Kia ora, ko Erica Wilkinson tene, he kona i purangi tene, e pa ana kinga Sounds of Science. This is part two of our chat with Brent Bevan, the Program Manager for Predator Free 2050. In the first part, episode 13, we covered Brent's conservation experience with memorable moments like chasing sea lions with a stick and catching mohua in his socks. In this episode, we're talking about the latest innovations helping us get to Predator Free 2050. We also cover 1080, staff safety and feral cats, so some quite big topics. Here's the Doc Sounds of Science podcast with Brent Bevan, part two. I've heard a rumour that you've got a really great white shark story. Ah, that's so funny. Uh, <laughs> I, had a, I mean, I, this is just an absolute privilege, actually, because I, I, when I was on Stewart Island, it's one of the epicentres of um, great white shark activity because there's so many seals there. So this is just a, a total system in action, which is really cool. So we've got the so many fur seals, thing. the prey predator mm. thing. So the, the great white sharks will come down every year. They, they travel all the way down and um, just hang around the seal colony, um, filling up on fur seals. And then at the end of the end of the breeding season, of the seal breeding season, about June, they take off again. They go all the way to Australia or New Caledonia, almost in a straight line. And the reason we know that is um, because we had a science program operating down um, off Stewart Island for a few years, tagging them and putting satellite tags in so we could see that they were going all the way to New Caledonia in a, in a directly straight line. And I got over a few seasons, had the opportunity to go out with Clinton Duffy and a few others to, oh, yeah. to tag these animals. And to tag them, you have to actually catch them and get them alongside the boat no, or you. get attract them in so they come right up to the boat and, and then you and there's a tag you can just jab into them. But these animals are like seven metres long, which is just, you know, five to seven metres long. And the thing you don't realise when you think about that is what is the depth and the width of, of them, you know, yeah. so they, you know, they, they'd come, they'd stand about a metre, <laughs> a metre and a half in height if you had it laid teeth. on the on the ground. <laughs> and they just, they look like they're just lazily swimming around, but but there's actually, well, and they are because they're, they're not afraid of anything. Mm. And I love the way they would check out the boat as they would, because um, they're never sure what the boat is. Mm. And, you know, you've got tuna and everything you're trying to get, you're putting oils out and then you have a bait that you drag in front of them to get them to come right up to the boat. Oh but they would um, check out the boat by biting. So I come up to the back of the boat and just bash it arr, 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 to see what it was, and that was how they check everything out. So that, I think that's why people get bitten. Uh, they're not they're not um, eating them. They just oh, what's this? I'll what check it, it out. Arr, arr. Oh my! So God. yes, so I saw um, and we would at times have five sharks just swimming around the boat. And when you put the the lure and you sort of jab jab the. Uh, Tag. Sorry, the tag. The tag, yeah. Uh, just on a pole, and when it got in really close, it just jabbed in just behind the dorsal fin. So, I mean, they also bite each other, so they've got quite thick skin, so it doesn't it doesn't really bother them too much. And did the back of the boat have quite thick skin? Uh, no, we had to replace the trim tabs on the boat every year because the sharks would bite <laughs> them off. So. Wow. So Predator Free 2050, can we do it? You know, if you think of it, it's it's just as, as basic as scaling up our current eradication technology, which we've been able to do. Um, so if we if we scale up eradication, that is one key element. The other key element is defendability. So the reason we don't really do eradications on the mainland is because we can't keep the pests out. Mm. So we use islands, which are, use water to keep them out, or we use those fence sanctuaries like Zelandia or Mongotauturi to, um, to keep, you know, the fences keep the predators out. So... If we can solve the defendability and we can solve scale, so which is just logistics, how do how do we do things that yeah. bigger, 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 <laughs> bigger scale, then um then we're pretty we're pretty well set to start to roll it out across the country. So this is where the focus is at the moment is on the science, the technology, the understanding of how we do it, mm-hmm. as opposed to lots and lots of hectares. Yeah. But um okay, we've got a really cool program happening in the in the um, science space with and defendability, what we're calling farms as barriers at the moment. So it's using farms, because we've got to do eradication everywhere. So we're suddenly going to think, oh, how do we do eradication on farmland? Yeah. And if we achieve eradication on farmland and you leave everything in place, 
can you use that? So if a stoat comes in, will it get captured or caught or killed before it gets out the other side? And if you do that, you suddenly got a new barrier or a new fence. And, you know, look at a map of the North Island. You can pretty quickly divide the North Island up by farms Farm and you move them. You know, they're, they're movable barriers. So yeah. it's fantastic. It's a, you'd unlock so much of Predator Free just through that simple solution. So you've talked about farms being used as barriers. What else can be used as barriers? Barriers is you got to think of it in, a, in the broader sense like we're talking about with farmland. So there's a, some work going on around um, what they call virtual barriers, which around trap lines, things like that. Can you have enough traps in place to create a barrier? Um, Miramar is looking at the airport runway as a barrier because uh, animals don't really like crossing open ground. So can you use that sort of sort of thing to, to prevent movement? Well, if I was a mouse, I wouldn't want to cross that while there were planes coming in. No, no, you get a quite, quite a flat mouse. Um, the... Other things that are happening, we've got a fences um, and the Zip guys, Zero Invasive Predators, are a little startup company that's doing lots of research in this space and innovation and engineering. So they've got a, a, a low cost, low fence, which will keep everything out except cats. So that's um, that's in development. The They're trying things like lights, you know, like if you're a nocturnal animal and you don't like lights, can you use lights as a barrier? And then we've got... Um, Alpine ranges, so the Southern Alps is actually quite an effective barrier to movement for these animals because yeah. they don't like going across. And big rivers, um, they're not impermeable, but um, if you have a big river system, it can be a really good barrier where you lower your invasion to low enough that you can you can treat it. Like so, the Perth Valley? Like the Perth Valley. It's got uh, Perth Valley is an area in South Westland where uh, Zip is trying a eradication and defend site at scale. So it's about 10,000 hectares. The reason they chose that site is it's got two rivers that run around it and compl- and protect it. So they get some invasion, but manageable. So this is the point is can you lower it? So barriers don't have to be impenetrable, mm. but they have to get you to a point where you can manage the reinvasion. And and it is a really, it's, and it's not just the barriers to things coming in, but it's how do you detect them and get rid of them when they're in there. And this is, this is where we're making a lot of advance and a lot of investment into things like artificial intelligence and um, smart devices and data connectivity. So then you get into a spot where you either have a camera or something like that that can tell you, oh, rats turned up here. And if it's really smart, then you go, rats turned up here and I've killed it for you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and that's yes. such a... Such a that's such a game changer for that ability to defend sites. Because um, in one of your blogs, you talk about the the pause sensors and the AI cameras. Um, can you tell us a bit about those? Yeah. So so one of the things when we achieve eradication, we want to we we want to know if something gets in, and we want to know really quickly so we can um, protect against it. And if we had been on Olver Island that those years ago when the rats came in, if we had something on site that could tell us immediately that a rat's arrived, we would have prevented a population establishing. So it's huge cost saving. Um, and if you think about our islands at the moment, we go out every four months to do a biosecurity check. So you're giving animals quite a period. We're developing a couple of uh, Devices. One's called Pause, which is print acquisition for wildlife surveillance. I just so, want to be in the room where they were thinking, "How can we make it say Pause? How can we make it sound like Pause? Yeah, that's a. It's like a. It's like a. It's a sensor pad, like a cell phone, like you tap on your smartphone. You know, it's sort of like one of those laid down in a tunnel. The animal runs through, and it's through its print patterns. It can tell you whether it's a Norway rat, a ship rat, a possum, a cat, um, a ferret, a stoat, and so. Once it's done that, it's then linked to send you a text or an email or whatever you want to so you immediately know that that animal is there. And then the same with the cameras. There's a lot of work going on with different cameras, some um, some just standard cameras, but infrared cameras seem to be really creating quite a breakthrough. And the infrared cameras can sit there, follow an animal, and then through artificial intelligence, through its shape and movement, what it does tell you whether that's a possum or a rat or a state. And again, linking it into some form of data connectivity through your cell phone or an email will tell you that that animal's there immediately. Next stage for us is linking that to something that will deal with that animal immediately. Like said. a drone. Yeah, or there's one uh, one thing that's been explored by Zip is a um, lure. So you can or just think of it like this way. There's a sort of mayonnaise-based feeding product there that the camera's on Mm -hmm. and stoats love it. So they'll go and just eat this mayonnaise that's freshly dripping out over a period of time. They get really love it and they get into it and the camera goes, oh, stoats turned up at this one. Well, you could use your AI to turn on another four maybe around that have mayonnaise with a toxin in it. 
and then the stoat will go to the next one, next one, next one, and it will get killed. Or you link it into a new type of trap that the cacophony guys have started developing a new trap that just looks looks flat. It's open. There's no, there's nothing there, and the animal just walks into this area where the lure is or whatever's brought it in, and then the sides shoot up, and um, and it's all enclosed in the space. So there's things like that that you know you can really change the game. Imagine having a trap where you um. You know, if you're a Kiwi or a Tuatara, you can walk all the way through it and nothing happens. And it's only when it goes, ah, oh, you're a possum. We need to get rid of you that, that it goes off. <gasps> That's so clever. Grant Ryan from the Cacophony Project has talked about very interesting things in terms of um, he showed me this this trail camera footage of a trap and how all these rats went around it and it took one rat going into it and then they all followed it as well because they follow the rat in front? Yeah, and they follow those sensory and, vi- and clues. You know, I said they hunt by smell. It's the same. So they'll follow those clues to food. But um, we've got a new part of our part of our activity is funding product development. So we always do new technology, which is heaps of fun. We've got a, we've got a fund called Tools to Market, which is just literally what it does. It pays for new tools to come in. The people who are developing it, we, we give them funds to help bring these products through to market. Mm-hmm. And um, Predator Free 2050 Limited, the company that is doing work in the space as well, the charitable company, it's got one called Products to Projects, and it's very similar. So they work side by side. They um, So one of the ones I like in there that has been developed is this, is this thing called a Spitfire device, and it's uh, sort of getting to that smart technology end of it. So it's got a... Um, it's got a possum one where a possum stands and through its weight and its and its height, they can tell it's a possum and it's got to climb up to get it. And then it will squirt some um, what they call pap as a new type of toxin. Well, it's not new, but we, we haven't used Nearly it much used. in the past. Gets mm. sprayed onto its belly fur. And then the possum goes and licks it up and um, and that's how it gets poisoned. So, so we're funding that. And um, these guys also do drones, which are really cool. So we're funding a... Um, We've got this heavy lift drone, uh, which is which will lift 300 kilos, and um, and they're looking at a ways of doing aerial distribution from the drone. And as we think about our carbon into the future, that becomes really important. Yeah. But we've also got, um, you know, we might develop that, that pap stuff we're talking about. We're trying mm-hmm. to develop an aerial sausage bait for stoats and ferrets and cats, the mm-hmm. wild cats. Yep. So if we can um, if we can do that, then we this drone could be a distribution mechanism. Or we might end up in a space where we're getting traps that you can distribute by ear. So it's just you know trying to link all these different projects together as well as part of. I suppose it's part of what my team does is is you know make sure they don't operate in isolation, get but get pulled together into yeah. work. That it's a national yeah. overview. Well, we've got a program running around long life lures. So we said um, we're just bringing out a rat one. It should be in market soon from um, Victoria University. And they're working on another one, a multi-species lure. So these things are chemical, but they're as attractive to rats as peanut butter is. But they last six months smelling fresh as a daisy the whole way through. So, so they sit in this space. And the advantage is once you get that, if you've got a, if you've got someone overlooking the program, we can link that to the paws unit so that the paws guys have a long life lure that's det- tra- attracting animals, and you can link it to. S- you can link it to this something else to get an animal into it. So they all, you know, they all overlap and they all need to come together to, to start to leverage off each other to create the step change we need to deliver predator free. And then we can get there even faster. And then we get there. So we we know that a business's usual approach is the pathway to extinction, as we've called it. But some people don't love the use of 1080 in Aotearoa. Are you worried about that sentiment, the anti-1080 sentiment? Uh Yes and no. I mean, I, I think the re- the reality is. I don't think. I know the reality is that we need to keep using it. Um, it's mm-hmm. a it's an effective tool until we get to the point of achieving eradication. Uh, we need to keep these animals alive, and the only way to keep them alive is to remove the predators. And at the moment, the best methodology at large landscape scale space and the scale that you know, like a million hectares sort of space we need, is aerial ten eighty. It's still a space for people to do trapping and everything else and lots of other stuff, mm. but. We can't walk away from that tool at the moment. I think most New Zealanders get that. I know there's a real vocal minority, but I'm pr- mm. they are in the minority. So as long as most New Zealanders understand the logic and we're doing it right, then I'm not so worried about that. Mm-hmm. But I do worry about the impact on staff and um, and people. And I think it's I think when people personalise it in New Zealand society and really really target people, mm. I I just think that's unfair. It's not how we 
if you ever described what a New Zealander's character is like overseas, I don't think you would ever include that element of it because it, it's just, it's not how we want to be as a country. And I dislike that bit. That's such a good way to, to put it. Do you, do you get it personally a bit? I, I have. I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a social media lugget. Um, I, I'm not, so I just don't look at comments and it doesn't bother me, but I have personally had it. I've been, um, I remember, uh, when we were first discussing post control on Stewart Island, I held a public meeting about, there was no post control on Stewart Island at the start. We were trying to find a way to go through it. And there was so much anti t and sentiment because we were holding all options open because we wanted the discussion. I had to take, I had to get the policeman to come down in uniform to stand behind me at the meeting mm. because it was that hot and heated and targeted. So, um, so yeah, we're, Every, I think everyone who's worked in predator control, or pest mm. control and conservation runs into that at some point in time. But I I just encourage people to reflect on the style of debate and discussion they're having because, like I said, when you personalise it on onto people who are passionate about their life's work and what they're doing and they're usually getting paid poorly to try to look after these species, you know, <laughs> it's their, they're in it for the right reasons mm-hmm. and they're mission driven and this yeah. is what they want to do to, to then personally target them um, because of your belief is, is not, I don't think that's, you should really seriously reflect on that. Absolutely agree. Predator Free 2050 is the big three, but it excludes feral cats. Tell me about that. It doesn't totally exclude feral cats. So we've we've got this idea that where they're an issue at place, we need to we need to manage them. And they're a key predator. I don't mm. think people really understand how much impact feral cats are having. Yeah, they're an apex predator. They're our little mini tigers that are going out and and killing all the little animals. Um, I remember seeing one cut open that had over 20 skinks in it. You know, they mm. just vacuum up our lizard fauna particularly and ground nesting birds. So places like Auckland Island, um, down in the Subantarctic, and the Rakiura Stewart Island, where we've got cats squarely in the target for getting rid of them um, from those places. They just don't belong there. They're, but the problem we've got with, with feral cats or cats in general, why we can't bring it into a national eradication program is we can't control the breeding. They're... Um, they're there's there's lots of pet cats and there's lots of stray cats mm. and um and because we've had such a long history of pet ownership with cats there's um there's very little legislation or ability or social social capital mm. or to or buy into the idea of containing or controlling or not letting cats breed and look it's only a, a feral cat and a stray cat and a domestic cat there's not really a difference between them. The only difference is how well fed it is. So the only reason a cat stays at your home generally is that you're feeding it because they um, they are the same animals as the as the wild cat. Mm. You see those populations of stray cats sitting around towns, look, they're just producing so many offspring that are feeding into the rest of the country. So at the mm. moment, we, probably mainly due to social issues, we just can't include those animals within a nationwide eradication. Okay. And on Auckland Island, they're looking at um, eradicating them completely yeah. with the PAP? Uh, well, we got, we're looking at mice, uh, feral pigs and cats on the Auckland Islands. And if we, if we can do that one, that's the last island in the New Zealand sub-Antarctic group to have pests taken off it. So, and the biggest, right? And the biggest. So we've done, we did the Antipodes Island with the Million Dollar Mouse Program a couple of years ago. We did Campbell Island before that and we did Enderby. So we will be the first country in the world to completely clear um, pests off all of our sub antarctics which is one of our world heritage sites. They are absolutely amazing places. So we're really aiming for that. That'll be great. And it also creates that step change, starts to scale again because it's 47,000 hectares. So it's starting to grow our understanding of scale and logistics and, yeah. and what we need to do. So I'm really looking forward to that bit happening. That's incredible. Tell me about one of your weirdest days at work. Okay, so when I was on, uh, when I, was on I was on a trip down to Campbell Island and we, we had this fantastic job where we, we, we wanted to do disease screening across the whole island because we were reintroducing Campbell Island teal. To, um, which had been completely removed from the whole island by rats. Mm. And um, we had a backup population, um, mainly out of captive breeding, that they were being just kept alive. And once we achieved rat eradication, we could take them back. Mm. But we didn't want to bring a, a new disease down that might affect wildlife. So we were 
catching birds and swabbing them, taking blood samples, all for all for these disease screening. Not something you do at home, but mm-hmm. for these disease screening requirements. So we were catching albatross and mollymawks and you know everything we could get our little hands on. Mm-hmm. But I was um, particularly over at Northwest Bay. We had to get yellow eye penguins, and there's um, at this one location. There were close to 100 yellow eye penguins. I think it was 96 yellow eye penguins would come down this one trail in the morning to um, to go out to sea to, to feed. And we just were in a line. Just And they, they were literally in a line coming down the site to, oh. to, to go offshore. And, and we were catching them. And I um, and I got in a bit of trouble because I, I caught three at once. So mm-hmm. I had one under each hand pinned to the ground and one under my – held down by my foot and my boot on its back. And that was all good till I realised I couldn't move. So, <laughs> so, so I, was, I was a bit stuck as to what did I do next to get these penguins in a bag so we could we could get them. But eventually someone came over and, and helped me. And helped you, and saw helped your me. plight. Yeah. Well, the albatross are amazing. Like we caught a we caught a, um, a wandering albatross to take blood from it. And it was like a hose pipe running down its leg. This is such a big blood vessel coming wow. down the leg to take blood from. But, but they're very big birds. Yeah. Very, very big birds. Mm. I mean, they've got a three, three meter wingspan when you get them up close. They're, um, they're a very big bird. Is there a single most important takeaway that you want people to understand about predator free? Yes. <laughs> predator predator free 2050 or removing these predators is. Is our responsibility and our responsibility for our kids. These are we live in this country, and and the only way to save our wildlife, the things that make us unique and make us who we are as New Zealanders, you know, our kiwi, our fio, all those all those birds we see every day on banknotes and that, but not in the wild. The only way to look after them is to remove these predators, and I think it's our responsibility as a nation to make sure we protect what was here before us. On top of that, we can do it. Like we can do it. It's it's mapped. It's ready. If we all buy into it, and we all take our own actions towards it, and we act like a team of five million, mm-hmm. then we will we will knock this one off, and um, it will be one of the greatest things we ever look back on in our history and say, "Gosh, what an amazing event we did as a as a group of people." And and I, it'll be a day where I'll be able to sit with my kids and feel very proud of what we did as a nation. And what can I do at home? Trap. You can trap. You you can conceptually support what we're doing, which is great. But trapping by yourself, um, a little bit limited on its mm-hmm. impact and what it can do. Sure. But if you start to link with your neighbours and people surrounding you, and you and you start to grow the scale, mm-hmm. then together as a community, you can make a difference. Fantastic! Thank you so much for coming in today, Brent. This has been such an incredible learning curve. Thank you very much for what you're doing for Aotearoa. My pleasure. Thank you, Erica. That's all for this episode. If you like what you heard, show us some love with a five-star rating. The Doc Sounds of Science podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts, so subscribe now, never miss an episode. 